The next topic in talking about databases is to talk really about their origins. And their origins really hail back to the about 1970 when E.F. Codd, as we know him today, or his full name being Edgar Frank Codd, um, wrote a paper called A Relational Model of Data for Large Shared Data Banks. Well, he worked for IBM. And one of the interesting little bits of history about this is even though he worked for IBM, IBM was was slow in adopting uh, the relational research that that EF Codd had done. Uh, kind of like all experts, you never loved it at home. But what is interesting is that even though EF Codd worked for IBM, IBM was rather slow in actually adopting the research that EF Codd had done in that uh, 1970 paper. And so Larry uh, Ellison from Relational Software Inc developed a database called the Oracle Database. Uh, and of course, you recognize that Oracle uh, became the name of the company eventually um, and implemented many of the uh, disciplines that E.F. Codd had originally put in his database paper. Now, the important things about the, the paper is that it stated that the data needed to be independent from the application layer. You had to be able to have the data in one spot and the application would then access the data. But in changing the data and making uh, the view of data available to the application, you shouldn't have to worry about how you're changing the underlying data in order to continue managing the application. In other words, he advocated divorcing the data from the application itself. Prior to then, all of the data was just driven strictly in the application. The application would bear the burden of holding the data within itself and then would not be able to be modified very easily because the data and application were completely connected. So in the first principle that E.F. Codd put in his paper was simply that you needed to make sure that the data didn't uh, wasn't dependent on the application in such a way that when you modified the application, you also had to modify uh, the data set underneath it, uh, except maybe to a minor degree, but that usually when they're separate, you can, you can do an awful lot with the application without ever having to touch the data layer. Um, the next principle was that it needed to be normalized, that there should be no repeating groups in the data. And we'll talk later about what normalization is all about and get into some detail there. Um, the next thing is that the data needed to be encapsulated in such a way in a database management system such that when you queried it with a query language that you could easily get to the data, format the data, create views out of the data, and, and basically retrieve information from uh, the data sets. And that these languages needed to be able to be expanded on their own, separate from the kind of data. And that if you structured the data correctly, you would then be able to expand the SQL language, which was the original name that um, EF Codd gave to the language that would get information from these databases. Um, later, it was shortened to SQL. In fact, Larry Ellison, because um, SQL, S-E-Q-U-E-L, all spelled out, was um, patented or trademarked by that time. He shortened the term to SQL, and we kind of know it as SQL today. So what he had in there is a bunch of terminology that, that may seem a little cryptic to you and I today. He had a, a thing called a relation, and we know a relation today as a table, you know, columns and rows. Uh, he had a term called an attribute. Well, an attribute of the data is a column in the table. The domain, was, as it was called, is the list of allowable values in a particular column or field, um, like character. Only character values could be in a particular field, or numeric character uh, values such as uh, an integer or a, a floating point variable. Um, then he had, he called uh, the rows in a database tuples. Uh, not much used today, but a row was a tuple in the original paper. Cardinality was the number of rows in a table. Uh, 
um, as you develop databases, you'll know that some tables have a fixed number of rows. Like for example, if you had to document the number of states and their abbreviations in the United States, you'd have a fixed number of row of 50 rows in that table. So the cardinality of a state abbreviations table would be 50 in this case. So a related, relational database was then really defined as a set, a collection of normalized relations. So you had a database that had a bunch of linked tables that eliminated all the duplication and allowed them to be linked from what they call primary key to foreign key by what they end up calling uh, data, uh, database calculus or relational calculus or relational algebra. And we'll talk, talk about those topics a little bit later. So as things have evolved, you know, what EFCOD called a relation or a tuple or a, an attribute today, um, most of us learn that as a table or a row or a column. Sometimes they can be called also that a table would be a file or a row would be a record. In fact, if you're looking in an application, you create records uh, within an application a lot, of, a lot of times. And users, when they come to you, will generally uh, see each uh, entry that they put into the table as a, as a record. Um, or they could be known as a field. Well, in, a, in an application, they would, may show up as a field where it's actually one, one column or one row in a particular table that has a particular attribute showing up on the form, but your users will call that a field uh, where it's actually a column in your table. So as we continue to explore relational databases, this whole beginning in 1970 of the relational database design through this paper by E.F. Codd becomes critical. And as we learn about the various topics, we'll dissect and continue to uh, evolve the information uh, as we go forward. Now, if you liked what, what was sh shared in this video, please you know comment in the comments below. If you have any questions, especially, uh, put some comments down there. And if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, uh, please do. It's, it's free, and then YouTube will let you know when I've posted my next video. Thanks. We'll talk to you again later.